Wonderful. Right. We are on the right track. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right, well, thank, you. Thanks, thank you for your kind assistance, whoever that was. <laughs> it's it's sometimes important to get some tech support, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> How are you this morning? Good, good. It's turned into a bit of a busy day, so <laughs> right. yeah, all good. Hopefully this will be yep. okay. I'm in I'm at work in a meeting room, so hopefully the sound is all right. Yeah, no, you're really clear. So that's fantastic. Oh, so how was Easter for you before we jump on in there? Oh, yeah. it's been, um... oh it was good. Yeah, no, I had a nice Easter. Too short, but, you know, yeah, it's oh, great. I know. I'm uh, hoping that New Zealand sometime in my working future drops to a four-day week. But I say that, but then I work weekends anyway, so yeah, <laughs> I yeah, don't know yeah, what yeah, it is. Right. True. I think we might, uh, we've been playing with the idea of a four day office. Right. Um, yeah. Just because, you know, Mondays and Fridays, it's like, you know, crickets in the office anyway. And there's just nobody comes in. So you sort of wonder do you actually compress the office week so you get more people in when, yeah, you know, over that in period. the office together? Yeah. So yes. I know some other businesses have been doing that. Um, but yeah, anyway, we're still work in progress. <laughs> yeah. We have a Monday morning meeting, which I actually really love because oh. it's the one time we know we'll all be together. Um, but we are also a small team, so we're a little bit more agile and easier to easier to manage nine or ten people versus the numbers that you have, Maxine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. So shall we jump on into it then? Okay. All right. Excellent. So starting off with, what does recruitment and career mean to you? Yeah, that's kind of a big question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think it's changed over the years. Probably, you know, when I was young, it was all about um, climbing the corporate ladder and, uh, you know, getting the big office in the corner and, and all those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, when I started out, you know, it was all about being suited and booted and, you know, you in flash buildings and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think over my career, I've sort of learnt that actually that stuff doesn't really make your job fulfilling. And um, I've had, you know, lots of jobs when I was young where I had a, I had a flash office in Sydney in a car and it was probably the worst job that I had. Um, so I think I've learned that actually your career is about finding things that um, you enjoy and that you can contribute to and add value, um, that that's what's really important, um, and finding cultures that um, enable you to be at your best. So, uh, you know, I think my view of, of um, career has changed quite a lot, but I think the world's view of careers and roles have changed as well but yeah for me it's do what you love and where you can really add value and recruitment is so much for me about that as well so going out mm. and finding great people um not finding you know a cv with a whole lot of stuff that you can tick off yeah there's so much more behind just the skill set right that whole That's human right. person and yeah. what they bring from those experiences. Yeah, that's right. I love that sharing around. Um, I kind of faced the same thing. I had some girlfriends that went on their OE and I was working as a salesperson in freight and logistics. And so I got a company car quite early on in my career and was making pretty reasonable money. Um, and then they would come back from overseas and they'd be like, gosh, you've got this car and this money. And, but the pressure was immense. And, you know, for someone quite young and I was managing international uh, calls, so you'd be getting calls from all over the world and, and the requirements of that. Um, it was great and I did enjoy it. But I think, you know, you've got to understand the full package and what is fulfilling and you go through these, would you say, peaks and troughs of your career? vaccine of kind of finding that yeah I mean absolutely and you know everyone makes mistakes you know you, you go for something or you get enticed by the carrot and you think yes. oh yeah I'll do this and then you get in there and go actually you know I don't love this um it's not it's not for me 
and that's also part of your learnings I guess as well you find the right kind of environments you know mm. that that you thrive in um and I think that early on in your career you you don't know that you don't know what works for you so you do have to go through some of that um learning the hard way of you know uh what types of businesses what sizes of businesses what cultures actually work for you so yeah absolutely mm -hmm. you you make mistakes along the way you learn from those and hopefully the next one you, you get it right <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> So you've had a really varied career with infrastructure themes, energy through to telecommunications, and now in payments. How is this similar or different from what you'd expected your career to be when you completed your university study? Oh, completely different. <laughs> um, when I when I was at university, I mean, you know, I wanted to get into marketing and in my brain, probably at that point, marketing was all about what we probably call colouring in now. So it was all, right. you know, the, the sort of sexy side. Um, but I think, well, I came out of university while well, New Zealand was in a big recession. So mm. I went to Melbourne to look for a job. And um, I ended up with Shell on their graduate trainee program. And it was in their marketing graduate trainee program. But interestingly, we didn't do any marketing for quite a long time because they spent a lot of time putting us in different roles around the company to learn about how a business works. And at the time, I thought that was awful. Um, hated doing <laughs> lots of the things that I was asked to do. Really? <laughs> wow. But, um, but, you know, because, you know, you'd be doing everything. I think my first job with Shell, you know, a lot of the time I was doing PowerPoints for my boss, you know. Um, right. And, you know, and then I kind of progressed on to doing all sorts of things like um, uh, doing training for truck drivers on new systems that we were implementing to fill, tr to fill trucks with petrol and that kind of thing. So really really removed from my idea of marketing um yes. but, but in the end hugely valuable experience that taught me a lot about how a business functions right across the board because i got to do everything um and also huge amount of training so fantastic training that from those organizations so you know i kind of ended up there and then from that i guess opportunities that came up um ended up as you say and kind of industrial and infrastructure type roles yeah. which would have you know I would have never even thought of doing and I did head back into the marketing and product arena in those in those companies but yeah very different flavor of business and very different flavor of marketing that I ended up um, doing and you know very much product development and marketing in that kind of business to business industrial area which actually, when you're at university, they talk very little about. Um, mm. Well, certainly, you know, when I did it, it was much more, you know, marketing was about Procter & Gamble, not about, you know, how do you do B2B. So, yeah, really different. But, you know, I've loved it on the way. And, you know, it was a whole new, whole new area for me and um, totally different uh, concepts with, you know, business to business and industrial style of marketing and, and what I now consider to be actually the more fun side because it's a lot it's a lot meatier. You know, I yeah. always think it's it's a hell of a lot harder because you actually have to really understand your propositions and really understand mm. your individual customers. So yeah, it's been a great journey, but yeah, not one that I <laughs> would have thought of <laughs> if someone had said, Hey, what do you want to do? <laughs> it wouldn't have been that. <laughs> So it's definitely the squiggly line of the career that, uh, <laughs> that yeah. what's a key misunderstanding or a tip for young women as entrepreneurs working in a business that want to climb that corporate ladder within an organization? I think the, the biggest tip is, um, you know, kind of be true to yourself. I think young mm. women, uh, tend to be quite nervous when putting themselves forward, even if that you know may not come across externally. You'll find that, you know, and I think it's been proven in research that that women tend to think, oh no, I can't do that role because I haven't got absolutely everything 
that you know is on the tick box whereas a guy will just assume he can do it um and you so often see women don't even put up their hands for roles because they assume they won't get them so i think mm. you know um be a bit bold and have a go as part of it even if you don't think that um you have everything um you know it's it's an element of fake it till you make it i guess which i think women are not good at so I think that's one thing and also just putting up your hand because people don't know yes. that you're interested or you're sometimes that you're even there if you don't put up your mm. hand um but i think also you have to you have to be you um i often think sometimes the best jobs you get and the best interviews you do are actually when you don't care because yes. you just bring yourself and not what you think they want yeah. um and, you know, and as i said before i think very importantly find a culture that fits for you and um you know don't stay trying to bash your head against the brick wall and in, in the environment that just doesn't work for you um I think, mm. you, know, you need to get out and move on and find one that does it's so true because you can not only use a ridiculous amount of energy doing that but it does change who you are as an individual if you continue to expose yourself to that over time um and you get worn down and you see people that, that have become cynical because of those types of environments. Yeah, and I think, you know, ultimately people get burnt out really quickly doing mm -hmm. that. I mean, you know, pretending to be someone else is extremely stressful um, at God, the end yes. of the day, <laughs> you know. And you also, you know, if you're doing that, you're not bringing all of you to the business, right? So, mm. you know, you're not able to be your best so I think, you know, it's really important that you understand that. And I think a lot of people don't. A lot of people keep trying to fix or change the the business they're in. They're not going to change. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lesson that I've learned the very hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was um, also re-listening to Lean In, um, an audio book, and um, that whole piece around, yes, the confidence internally that men and women have and the knocks that we take in a harder way, but making yourself visible. So keeping your hand up, she shares a really fantastic story in there about how she ended a lecture she was going to. Um, she said, no more questions. And every woman put their hands down and yet the men kept their hands up. And because she saw hands in the room, she continued to take questions. And somebody came into her office later and said, I learned from your speech to keep my hand up. Um, so yes, being visible so that you can be chosen yeah. is yeah, absolutely. another great example. Yeah. So what has your greatest career challenge been? And I'd love to know why and how you overcame it. Yeah, I thought about this one. It's, it's actually quite a hard, it's like, hmm. it's a hard question, actually. Um, yeah. I guess, I mean, there's been a few along the way. Um, I think probably, you know, for me, it's been, um, particularly when I was younger, I was pretty quiet, um, reserved kind of person. And I think that has been the challenge for me in terms of, you know, putting my hand up and thinking that, you know, I can do it um, and letting mm. people know that I'm there. So, you know, that's something I've had to learn and also that making sure I got the fit right um, and, yeah. um, and going for and understanding what that fit was and going for mm. the right sort of companies with the right cultures where I could actually, um, you know, make a difference and, and, you know, really fly. So I think that was... It's big thing, has been a big learning, big challenge for me. Um, I guess on practical levels, you know, I've I've had situations where, you know, we've gone through big merges and, um, you know, I kind of refer it as to the big swinging dick syndrome. So you go through the merger mm -hmm. and, you know, and the boys give the, the jobs to the, you know, the big guy with the loud voice and I'm yeah. sitting there going oh what <laughs> and um <laughs> I've had to kind of pick myself up off the floor and then see other opportunities um mm. you know and um you know I had one role and I won't name names for um <laughs> for obvious reasons but you know yes. where, where that kind of happened but another opportunity in the business came along and I took that and I didn't know anything about 
um, this particular role or what it did. Like I literally had to Google it. Um, <laughs> and But it turned into something that really made a difference for me and, um, and you know, was a fantastic opportunity that opened a whole lot of other doors. So I think yeah. it was also learning that sometimes you get the knock down but yeah. it, you know you have to pick yourself up and go and find that next opportunity and let those doors open because where one closes another one always kind of opens yeah that's such a great lesson in resilience um understanding that those opportunities can be there and having faith but i think also really heartening for young women who might feel that they are quiet or don't quite understand um, how to stand up and then they lose the what they think is the one opportunity. What I share with my mentees is that there's, there's never just one shot. Uh, no. There are going to be opportunities and you'll learn something even if you don't love it necessarily and it might not be that day you learn it, but you can certainly come back and revisit and in hindsight see it from a different perspective. Um, so that's a great share. Thank you. How important is negotiation? So whether as a candidate when you're discuss discussing an offer or with partner businesses, and what's your approach to that? I think negotiation is very important across all those things. Um, mm. I think in terms of when you're a candidate in a role, you often think you know, you're kind of, you, you're not on the position of power, as it were, because you want the job. Um, but I think the other thing that I've learned is, it, you know, it never hurts to ask. So what have you got to lose? Mm. So, you know, yes. I think, you know, rather than going into, you know, that kind of negotiation, thinking that you are in a position of power and, you know, and being a bit sort of obnoxious about it. No, you don't want to do mm. that. But if there's genuinely a concern that you have or something that will mean it goes from being a great experience to an awesome experience, then I think you should ask because as I say, yeah. it doesn't hurt. All they can say is no. Um, and sometimes you do learn from the answer they give you because, you know, um, how people respond is also important. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's the thing I've learned. It doesn't hurt to ask. Nine out of 10 times you'd be surprised though, you know, you'll get what you ask for. Um, and sometimes you don't, and then you can just evaluate how important that is to you. In terms of your partners, oh yeah, absolutely negotiation is important. But I think for me, it's about being, you know, honest and straightforward. Um, you know, if people feel they can trust you, you put your cards on the table and that's whether it is a customer or a partner that you're working with, you know, it's all about, as I say, straight talk, say the way it is, and then everyone knows where they stand, um, mm. you know, and, and get a win-win for everybody. I think there's nothing worse than when you are trying to supposedly partner with people that you don't think are telling you the truth, um, because at the end of the yeah. day, it just falls apart. So yeah. if, if there's hard stuff that you need to tell them or stuff that you think they won't like, you need to get it out on the table um, and then you can move forward to a, to a better place. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's um, having the courage to have those difficult conversations, uh, but they can bring you closer together. So it's approaching them and making sure, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that have, always felt that's really important. You get the bad news out as soon as you can. Uh, and then you go into solution mode. Let's unpack what happened after we get the solution underway uh, to ensure we don't have it happen again uh, or that this doesn't impact on how we worked together. But yeah, I completely agree with that. Well, I think sometimes also getting the cards on the table, people then understand where you're coming from. Um, and sometimes yeah. it can be, a, oh, okay, I understand now why that's important mm. to you. And so, you know, why we need to talk about that and come to a resolution. Otherwise, if you don't tell mm. them, then they're wondering, well, why are you upset about that? Or, you know, yeah. <laughs> why is that a big <laughs> issue for you? Yeah. And sometimes it's even about the process, right? I work across startups through to 
ridiculously large organizations and I know that you're in a, a beast of an industry and you work with banks too and uh, they can be very slow moving those cogs can take a long while to turn and um, I know they've had some startup partners that are going how is this taking two weeks we can do this in half an hour uh, completely different environments and yeah. um, requirements to to shift some of those gears yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah how do you think technology will continue to change the ways of working? We've talked a little bit about that remote and maybe condensing weeks uh, before we started. And what are the opportunities for promotion within an organization in the next two to five years based on those? Um, I think, you know, technology, technology and probably as much just um, culture change in the world is you know, hugely changing um, businesses at the moment and our ways of working. But, you know, it's mm. funny, things that we've talked about for years, I think, are actually becoming reality. And, you know, I, I was on actually a Zoom call not long ago and uh, another CEO said, you know, we all had flexible working in our policies, but nobody actually did it, you know. And I think flexible working was about being able to stay at home to let the plumber in for a couple of hours before you went mm. to work. Um, so I think, so you know, that, yeah, the, the outcome of COVID, I think, all over the world is that we've learnt the value of people having flexibility and being able to work from home and work different hours um, so I think it will continue to evolve, you know, and, it, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, once we're through the whole vaccination thing and the world starts to open yeah. up again, um, how, how that does continue to change and evolve. Um, but I think it, it does open up lots of opportunities as well. It op opens up opportunities for us to... Um, you know, work remotely, not just within New Zealand, but provide more remote working internationally. I think borders mm. in general become less um, important. Um, you know, our group CEO uh, sort of laughs and says he loves loves New Zealand because when he's asleep, we make money. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, that's you know, kind of... You think, well, yeah, well, how do you kind of take that as an opportunity in New Zealand and for New Zealand businesses and that, you know, mm -hmm. we are awake when the, a lot of the world is asleep and, and now that we've kind of broken down that distance issue because everyone's working from home, we've proven that that's okay, how does that mm. kind of give us more opportunity? Um, but, yeah, I think also just, uh, you know, while technology is changing people's roles, and that's, you know, undoubtedly true. Um, the roles are still there and people still need to be led and managed. And there's also lots of things that still need to be done. But I think we're all in a, you know, the roles are changing and what people need to know is changing and the way they do things are changing. But, um, mm. yeah, still plenty of opportunities for promotion. In fact, at the moment, because we have such a shortage of people in New Zealand, you know, we are stretching and promoting our people internally as much as we can. One, to make sure that they stay with us because they have exciting roles and can mm. see a career path, but also because, you know, um, we can't find people and we've got good people who have a lot of our, um, particular business knowledge. So how can we train them and and stretch them and grow them into to new roles to go forward in the business and then bring new younger people in under them. So it's almost mm. in some ways a, a review strategy of what it's been, you know, for the last few years. Now we're actually going, yes. well, how do we take all the great people within the business, get them trained up to take on our bigger leadership roles and, and then bring in young people underneath because, you know, the, the super qualified people out there are so rare at the moment. You can't sit there and go, well, I'll just hire externally because they just don't exist. Mm. Yeah, we've got another question coming up to speak even more about that. I know. <laughs> There's a lot going on in payments at the moment, the space you're in. What can you share about how this might impact both New Zealanders and businesses? 
Yeah, well, at the moment, there's a lot of discussion, which has come out of, of COVID, a lot of it around um, mm -hmm. the cost of payments in New Zealand. Um, and, you know, payments traditionally in New Zealand, we, you know, we have just been so lucky for, um, you know, our retail, it's been so cheap in the past because we had the good old mm. FPOS card and, you know, it was essentially more or less free for, for our retailers and us as consumers and we just happily, merrily spent with our plastic FPOS card and it all came out of our bank account and everyone was happy. Um, Magic. Yeah, it was all magic. <laughs> and, you know, and it, as a result of that, we have very little cash used in New Zealand, which yeah. is, you know, compared to other countries is amazing. Mm. Um, but now we're in a world where we've seen, you know, particularly because of um, loyalty, rewards, points, etc., the real growth of um, of the Visa, MasterCard, uh, credit cards and debit cards. And that's really driven cost in New Zealand for retailers. Yeah. And that's an issue we have to address. And it, it also puts at risk that um, at the moment we have competition in terms of our little FPOS card. Um, but, you know, as it's going at the moment, you know, that may disappear and then we won't have competition to those big global guys. And mm. what does that mean for our retailers? So there's a lot going on at the moment about what needs to happen in industry to make sure um, that we have competition in payments in New Zealand and we have yeah. a lot of cool new experiences um, and there are the right incentives for for banks and payment companies etc to to keep innovating so we stay ahead of the rest of the world and so that our merchants you know are not having to pay um, you know large fees uh, for payments and you know and we can get back to get back to where we were where um, you know they were able to really, get out there and compete without having to worry about this. So it's high on government agenda at the moment, but it's also mm. something that's, you know, business and, and the payments industry is, you know, really concerned about. So um, it's a bit of a watch this space, but definitely something I think, you know, everyone kind of needs to be aware of that um, we're, you know, potentially in danger of losing our good little FBOS card and, um, and that competitor to the to the big uh, big cards out there yeah which would be such a pity for how we've led the world um in this space for a number of years I work very closely with payments New Zealand and you know I, as you know I came from a payments background myself as well for a bit of time uh so I am watching this space rather eagerly uh, to see how everything transforms but as we touched on earlier it can be a very slow moving ship with the types of organizations uh, behind the scenes <laughs> yes absolutely and it's you know and it's a complex area and you know you have to yes. be so careful that you don't do something knee-jerk that has unintended consequences right so you need to keep it moving while you're building the new yeah. plane so right. <laughs> yeah exactly it's a typical yeah. task yeah <laughs> So we did just touch on this, but I'm going to dig a little bit deeper about those borders being closed um, and those challenges in the areas of both talent acquisition and retention. So you've talked a little bit about how that's changing with some of that pipeline, but uh, are there any other impacts to the business that you're finding around talent there? Yeah, I mean, you know, with that, it's, it's something that we talk a lot um, about to our global parent Um because we we are in a slightly unique situation in New Zealand with the border being closed, so mm. um, because of that, particularly in the technology area, we're finding getting hold of resources, getting people, is really difficult. Um, right. And at the moment, we're going through a cycle in New Zealand where everyone's poaching everybody's staff. <laughs> Um, it's a bit of shorter tapping going on, this is true. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, driving the cost up, which, you know, is a good and a bad thing. Um, mm. But also just, you know, that the people just aren't there. So, you know, that has mm. impacts on your productivity because, you know, just replacing people constantly is expensive and time consuming. And, you know, means that you kind of do have dips in what you're doing because you don't have that continuity of people who are kind of driving things forward so yeah it's becoming a real issue and you know we just we're finding we're spending so much time um 
recruiting, but also, you know, it, it means that the work that you do in retaining your people just becomes more and more important and making sure that we are, um, you know, an employee brand of choice and that we really are, um, you know, out there being a great place to work is just more important than, it, than it's ever been. Um, you know, I think going forward, you know, we're going to have to, hopefully the border isn't going to be changed, you know, has it closed for, for too much longer. But, you know, there is opportunity as well to perhaps um, some roles can be done remotely, perhaps from other places mm -hmm. and maybe share resources with Australia where people can can work from home. And we have had some of that happen. We've had people who've needed to go uh, home to Australia for family reasons and they've taken their laptop and they've been working for yep. six months, you know, remotely from Australia. In fact, when the pandemic first happened, um, we had a few people who were trapped in countries around the world uh, and right. we literally um, couriered them laptops and yep. uh, and they worked from wherever they were. We had people in India and people in Las Vegas and all sorts of things. Uh, <laughs> carrying on their on their roles by the laptop but so there are ways around it but it is getting increasingly mm. difficult yeah I've I, we work with a lot of technology companies and we're hearing the same thing that with the borders closed and an extended period of time and uh, not a hundred percent clarity yet around how immigration is going to handle those forward steps we do have technology, they can do testing and ensure security across borders for the right people. Uh, so there's more of that starting to be investigated and adopted across different businesses. Um, it's just another new consideration in the new normal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the most challenging aspect of your current role and how do you find a work-life balance within it? Um, I think my most, well, it's not, yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, there's lots of challenges in my current role from, you know, the, the people stuff that we're going through now, um, mm. managing the teams through this whole COVID thing. And you've got such a spectrum of people who, you know, the people who are kind of pretty relaxed about the whole thing to the people who are actually still quite frightened about um, COVID yeah. and its impacts. Um, managing the whole thing about we were only allowed 50% of the people in our office um, and we hardly ever get 50% in the office anyway. Um, mm. You know, so how do we, you know, the big challenge for us is how do we keep our culture and it to be a great place of work yes. when it's completely changed from what it was a year ago? You know, we don't have mm. a, an office full of people ever. You know, we have <laughs> half an office full yeah. of people, you know, so... Do, you know, we, we've actually started pulling desks out of the office and building more collaboration spaces so that right. when people come into the office, it is for the purpose of being together. Mm. Because when they're actually just sitting there, you know, doing their thing, um, they don't actually need to be together. You know, in fact, they get more yeah. done, you know, you know, as you know yourself, you, you know, if you're trying to write a report or code or whatever it is, you, you do a lot more by yourself without distractions when you mm. need people is when you need to bounce ideas and work together and then you need a space that enables you to do that. So, mm. you know, we're, we're trying to rearrange our office to make it a place that works for that more collaboration and connectedness and and less about desks and, and you know, monitors and things like that. So that that's a challenge for us. But also um, for me at the moment, because we are part of a global business, um, and, and, you know, part of the year we're 12 hours away from our head office. And mm. at the moment, it's as actually nice. away as you can literally be. <laughs> yeah, at the moment we, we feel like it's really good because it's only 10 hours. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, that, that is challenging. It's challenging because you are trying to get people who, you know, you've only got a window of time you can talk to them mm. really realistically to get across your business and help you because you are completely remote, you know, you can't get on a plane and go face to face people and learn stuff. So everything that you learn has got to be remote and is on is, is on Zoom or something. That's how you meet people. So it's quite, mm. um, that's quite different. It has its upsides. 
um, and that you actually, you're seeing people in their homes, even if they are yes. in Switzerland or Paris. And so there is a feeling of connectedness there, but it is, it yes. is, that's challenging. It's challenging working in that kind of global environment when, you know, you're so far removed and we're so far away. Um, mm. So yeah, that that's probably our biggest challenge and trying to maintain your work-life balance when you're doing a day's work and then you go home and you get on a call with Europe um, at night as well. So yes. you have to um, be very planned in trying to make sure that you have time out during the day um, and you have time to go do your exercise or walk the dog or mm -hmm. whatever so that you don't lose that because of this trying to manage the time zones. And, you know, I think that's something initially – Myself and my team were a little bit bad at, but um, right. we've now learned that you have to do it because you can't bring the best of yourself to your role if you're tired and grumpy. Um, yes. So you need to make sure that you you actively plan in that for your day to make sure you can you know be at your best. So that's a a big challenge for us and one that we you know as I say we're actively working on because otherwise. We all do get grumpy, and mm. you know, that that's not that's not helpful. So um. doesn't help productivity. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I um no. I think also you you do understand your own rhythm. So I uh, do generally like getting up early. I was up just before five. I was at the gym first thing this morning, and then I came home and took my dog for a bike ride and then kind of got into a couple of emails and some early calls. And I know that period for me between about 1.30 and 3 o'clock isn't my most productive. So I try and put tasks in there that aren't as mentally taxing um, and just take some time out and move away from the technology and get some food and, you know, hopefully get outside if it's a bit sunny and just take 20 minutes and, you know, get into that rhythm again. And then I like to do some stuff later at night. I just feel I had a second wind. So you're right. You've got to understand that and not, you can't be on the entire time, particularly when you've got these uh, requirements that aren't in your time zone. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it is, um, yeah, it can be tricky, but um, I think, you know, you've got to learn to navigate through that and, and not have the expectation. I keep saying to my team, you know, yes. you can't do a solid Kiwi eight hour day and then sit on a two hour phone call at night. Yeah. You know, it's just not realistic. You just, yeah. so, but people go, oh no, it's okay. It's okay. Until it's not. Um, and so, yeah. yeah, then it's really not. So we don't <laughs> want you to get there. No. <laughs> so speaking about that, I know that Paymark fosters a culture of bringing your whole human self to work. What does being imperfect, whole human and real mean to you? Um, gosh, it's a really hard one, isn't it, really? Um, yeah. I think it's about, you know, once again, being open and honest and um, sharing with those around you, you know, all the bits that make up you. Um, mm. You know, I think one of the things that we really learned during COVID, I know with my team, you know, I became CEO a week before our lockdown. And, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and uh, and I've got to, you know, I was lucky that I was already in the business. And so, you know, I knew the team. So, yeah, I started my role um, a week before lockdown as CEO. And, and I was fortunate that, um, you know, I was already in the business. So, you know, I knew my team, but I had lots of, we had a couple of new exec members as well. And we went into lockdown mm. because everything was, you know, teams. Um, but I think through that, we really learned that staying connected and sharing our kind of, who we were and what was going on in our lives um, was also really important. And it's part of the energy yeah. that you create as a team and feeling that other people know who you are. You yeah. can see people's strengths, you know, when their energy is up, when their energy is down, you know, and that really helped us. So we would, mm. you know, through that whole experience, we kind of learnt to, um, you know, we would have little half hour catch ups that were literally just to share anything, stuff, you know, um, what was going yes. on, how whether this was hard or easy or, 
you know, whatever, um, you know, kids, dogs, the whole kind of nine yards. And I think we've taken yeah. a lot of those learnings now as well. So we still make sure that we have those connected catch ups. Um, and I think that's mm. really important because that then enables, as I say, in terms of teams working together, playing to your strengths, making sure that you understand the energy levels of people and, and when, you know, when one team member kind of needs to take over from another because that's just, you know, they're in their dip at the moment. Yes. Um, <laughs> and to me, you know, your whole self is about playing to your strengths. I think a lot of, you know, when, well, probably 10 plus years ago, it used to be very much the HR thing was that you found out what you were crap at and you supposedly had to fix yourself. Um, yeah. You know, you, you, did, <laughs> you did lots of... You must um, be perfect in all of the ways. So well, that's that. right. That was always, you know, your 360 was always about finding out where your weaknesses yeah. were and then putting a plan in place to fix you. And I think now, fortunately, the world's moved on to realise, well, actually what you should be doing is building on the things that you're good at. Mm. There are some things you're only ever going to be mediocre at. So, yes. uh, you know, understand what you're good at. Yes, understand what you're not good at and make sure you've got other people around you who can do those bits, but mm. build on what you're great at. And I think if you're bringing your whole self, then, you know, and we've got an environment where you can do that, then you're able to share the things that make you different and make you, you know, your real strengths. And I had a, I had a friend actually, um, who once said to me, you know, never put the fat boy on the wing. And I always thought it was just such a perfect <laughs> analogy. Oh, I you love know? it. And I often say it to my perfect. team now. Yeah, they're going, oh, no, you know, but we can grow this person. And, and I'm just like, not into that role. That is not their thing, you know? So why would you do this? Yes, you know, you could get the big kid and you could try and get them to be a winger, but they're never going to be a great winger. They're too big. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, you that, know, is, that is coming along with me to many meetings. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I love that. Is there anything else you'd like to share as last words or a story that you have from your career, Maxine? Um, probably my last words were actually um, something that was shared with me. And I think, you know, as I say, during this crazy COVID time, we, it's probably become more of a reality for us. And that I think... You know, for a lot of people in business, um, they thought the people that were doing really well, really great, were the ones who stayed in the office the longest period of time mm. and sat at their desk, you know. Um, and I think what we've learned, you know, finally, and, and is that that doesn't have to be the case. And for me, you know, it's something that I've never believed. I've always believed mm. that, you know, there are people who like working in the middle of the night. So why can't yeah. they work in the middle of the night? And there are people, you know, like yourself, who prefers to get up at five o'clock in the morning. And if that's when you're at your best, then why are we judging people by whether they're in a seat from nine to five? Yeah. So I kind of feel relieved that the world <laughs> finally got there to understand yeah. that, that that whole concept was just crazy. Um, you know, and I think, you know, someone who, you know, I worked for once a CEO many years ago said something to me that's always stuck with me. And I remember I was, I was waiting, um, he was actually going home himself and I was walking past the lifts and he said to me, Maxine, go home. He said, clarity of thought is what is important. Yes. Absolutely. And you, there's a point, right? And you, then you just, your productivity continues to dive. You're not doing anyone any favors. No. Well, I mean, how many times have you sat at your desk thinking, oh, I can't go yet. It's too early, but um, you're not actually doing anything, you know, yeah. you're reading an email or, or, you know, now it's days, it's even easier. People are off reading stuff on the internet, you know, it'd be much better if they actually got up and went and did something else and came back when, you know, they are able to be productive, you know, in the yeah, time that works for on. them. 
focus on those tasks. I couldn't agree more. There's, it, it really was about just box checking and putting people into those boxes that were convenient, right? Um, and no, I've always, same as you, I believe in people's natural rhythms. And, um, you know, I have worked with friends of mine that are managers and they, they would touch if someone came in five minutes late. And I, I'm like, you're just missing the point here. <laughs> this, yeah, is not, this is not going to build trust or loyalty or ass- alignment to your strategy um, and enable you to, to really have a team that want to go all in and, and be there. Um, take your five minutes as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> It's been such a pleasure to spend time with you and um, make sure that you weren't in a fire alarm (laughs) (laughs) and catch up. Uh, This has been so great and obviously so many areas that I really resonate with, but your sharing has been so insightful. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun.